calf that you were blazing back into the old ruts again. It may not have been a complete return to your old familiar ways, but it showed your reluctance to break with them. Landscapers know that when mowing a very large lawn and you want to consistently achieve straight lines or stripes, you have to fix your eyes on something in the distance and don't look down or back to monitor your progress. The alternative is a spaghetti-like disaster. I believe that when Jesus warned us not to look back, he had Lot's wife in mind. You know the story. What was Lot and his family instructed by the angels? Don't what? Don't look back. And what happened? Lot's wife did and turned, the scripture says, into a pillar of salt. What was the main purpose of salt in those days? Preservation. By the way, when, when Jesus told us to be salt and light to the world, he was asking us to be directly involved in the preservation of life, the salvation of souls. Can a lump of salt that has been hardened or petrified into a solid mass accomplish this goal? No. Lot's wife became in reality what she had become in her heart. She looked back, but it was evident that she had already been looking away from God for a long time. And her action here revealed her heart condition, and it also determined her destiny. This morning, I want to share with you seven compelling reasons not to look back. Whether we are a new baptized believer, a multi-generational Christian, or a sincere seeker of truth here this morning, God has brought us here at this time and at this place for a reason. God has recognized rescued us from this this drowning world in sin. He has pulled us out of this burning house that is collapsing in on all of us. He has yanked us out of the quicksand of our own folly and set our feet on a solid rock. And he shouts, don't look back. Don't look back. Why? Reason number one, there is no guarantee that you will live to tell about it. We have all heard amazing testimonies from people who have come out of all kinds of crazy things. Drugs, gangs, addictions, destructive lifestyles, and and we, we, we think that the best testimonies are from those who go way out there to the to the very cusp of disaster away from God, and then then they come back in. But there's a huge danger here. A huge danger, because for every one testimony like that, there are a hundred about people who also went way out there, away from God, and then they died. In Ecclesiastes 7, verse 17, the wise man says, Don't be overcome with wickedness. Don't be a fool. Why die before your time? We can die before we're supposed to. We all know someone who has. And here's the risk. If we place ourselves on Satan's ground and knowingly embrace a lifestyle of sin, to some degree, we relinquish the protection of God. Isaiah 59, verse 2, the prophet tells us, your sins have separated you from God. I had a friend in college named Al. Al was a former Satanist and now was studying religion with the goal of ministry. Through a series of miracles, he had been rescued from Satan's deadly grasp, but he always spoke of being continually harassed by evil spirits and how they wanted to kill him. We prayed that he would stay strong and that he would never entertain the idea of returning, returning to his old lifestyle. During fall break, however, Al decided, for for whatever reason, 
to step back onto the forbidden ground of his past life. We never saw Al again, and later learned that he had been killed in a horrifyingly tragic accident. The point is this, if we look back now, what guarantee do we have that we will live long enough to change our mind? The answer is we don't. We are not playing with a mildly risky proposition here. We are talking about eternal life. Reason number two, we may become so jaded by the world that we won't want to come back. Open your Bibles to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Here in John 6, we find that Jesus was sharing a spiritual truth that was not understood or well received by the Jewish leaders, and even some of his own disciples were really struggling with what he was saying. Spiritual things, after all, the Bible says, are spiritually what? Discerned. And these listeners, with their hard hearts and preconceived ideas, were not ready to receive it. Jesus was saying that unless they eat his flesh and drink his blood, that they would forfeit eternal life. And his listeners, taking him literally, apparently, were appalled. His own disciples responded in verse 60. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And in verse 66, it says, from that time, many of his disciples, what does it say next? Went back and walked with him no more. Even though the numbers used in versification came in much later, it's interesting to note that this is John 6, 6, 6. In the book of Revelation, an identifying characteristic of the beast power opposed to God is this lineup of three sixes. And those who take the mark of the beast are those who turn back and walk with God no more. Notice also here in John who the people in this verse are who turned away and never came back. Who were they? His disciples. These were the people who believed in Jesus, who walked with Jesus. And when they walked away, they never came back. It's possible to become so disenfranchised by the world that we never even think to return to God. From the beginning, Satan has been using everything in his power to deceive us. And he is daily pouring, I mean literally pouring, deception into the minds and hearts of the unsuspecting through every kind of media imaginable. And what makes it so dangerous is that they and we are largely unaware of it. You've heard the expression, familiarity breeds contempt, right? But it also breeds contentment. The imagery of baby birds comes to mind, sitting in their nests, heads tilted back, eyes closed, peeping for that which they hope will satisfy, smooth in delivery, swallowed whole without a thought, ever wanting more. No one who is being deceived thinks of themselves as being deceived. If you think right now, well, <laughs> I'm not deceived, well, that's how deceived people think. So here's the thing, you can turn your back on God buy into what the world is offering, what the Bible calls the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, and become so jaded and so blinded that you wouldn't even know that you're lost. Reason number three. It's really a question. You're turning back? Really? What are you turning back to? The emptiness, the insatiable desires, the restlessness, the shame, the guilt, the ashes and aimlessness of your former pre-converted life? John 6, that's where we were. Let's look at the next verse. 
verse 67. Jesus turns to the twelve after many of the others left and asked, Will you also go away? Notice how Peter responds in the next two verses, verses 68 and 69. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that you are that Christ, the Son of the living God. When Jesus asks his disciples if they are going to turn back to follow the crowd, Peter responds, where would we go? And that's a question for us too. Where will we go? Really? Where are we going to go? A number of years ago, I had a former student email me and say, I've been reading and watching some stuff, and I've decided to become a Muslim. I was, I was curious as to what the stuff was, but decided not to ask. He was a pastor's kid. He was the quintessential PK stereotype that was always challenging everything shared from the Bible and championed the art of skepticism. And I knew he was looking for an exasperated response from me. Instead, I simply suggested he read a particular book I thought might interest him. In this case, it was Lee Strobel's A Case for Christ. Several months later, I received another email from him that simply read, I'm a Christian again. Do me a big favor. If you ever entertain the idea of looking back, of turning back, of walking away, I would like you to take a sabbatical from anything that has a screen. Those screens are passive things. They portray things that are active. As a verb, the definition of the word screen simply means to conceal, to mask, to hide. Screen plays and sports are always designed to block the opponents from actually seeing the truth about what is really taking place, thus gaining the advantage. The messages that the world often communicates through screens are designed to do precisely that, to conceal, to mask, to hide the truth by feeding us lies or half-truths or subtleties and insinuations that skew our discernment. And guess whose agenda that is? If asked, most would say that a screen, whether it be on your phone or computer or TV or theater, is designed to show, to reveal, to make plain. But Satan has the opposite in mind and has largely successfully manipulated the collective thoughts of the unsuspecting through screens. So remove yourself for a significant period of time and in the quietness of your soul, think about the reality that awaits you apart from Christ. The doubts, the depressions, the aimlessness, the despair, the insatiable desire for something more, the hopelessness, the unrest, the guilt. That's what you'd be going back to. I was sharing with a church member a few weeks ago my love for wilderness canoe trips. I have noticed that when I'm off the grid for extended periods of time, it takes me about three days to shed the stresses of life and to settle into the peace that God offers through nature. Apart from any social media or contact, I finally relax and embrace his presence and am able to see again, to, to see what really matters, to hear God's voice more distinctly. Everything takes on a fresh, new, clearer perspective. And once again, I am totally convinced in the quietness of my soul that only in Christ can we find purpose and meaning and happiness and hope and rest. Isaiah says it this way. Isaiah 35, verse 15. 
For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. But ye would not. Jesus is asking us today, where are you going to go? Christianity, in my experience and in my opinion, has the only rational answers to the questions of life. Reason number four, not to look back. We're all leaders. British poet John Donne wrote the famous line, no man is an island. Like it or not, we are all leaders. Anyone with influence is a leader. And we all have influence on others. Do not think for a second that your decisions are isolated and self-contained. What we think and do impacts others more than we know. And if suddenly we find ourselves looking back, you can bet, you can bet that others are looking back too to see what we're looking at. Years ago, there was an experiment conducted by a doctoral candidate who was doing his thesis on what is called mass or herd psychology. And in this experiment, he, he simply stepped out into a busy downtown street in a large city, and he stared up into the sky as if intrigued. Within seconds, dozens joined him. He removed himself from the gathering group and walked half a block, turned to look back at what now was literally hundreds of people staring up into the sky at absolutely nothing. We are leaders. Leaders have influence. The journey that we are on is not just about us. We live in community and as such, we have an important responsibility. Our salvation is inextricably wrapped up in other people's salvation. If we choose Christ and live for him, it can have a ripple effect for eternal good. If not, it can have a ripple effect for eternal ruin. In Proverbs 27, verse 17, the wise man speaks of the power of influence. He says, iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Someone may be lost forever because they chose to follow the example of another who looked back. Conversely, others may be saved because, like us, they choose to keep their eyes on the prize, Jesus Christ. And we don't have to have the gift of evangelist or pastor or teacher to have that kind of influence. We may not be an Apostle Paul, but our influence may win an Apostle Paul. We may not be the preacher-like person that Peter was, but we may win a preacher like Peter. Do you know who bought, brought Peter to Christ, by the way? Anybody know? Yes, John chapter 1 tells us that his brother Andrew brought him. It says, we have found the Messiah, Andrew said to John, and he brought him to Jesus. Andrew is rarely mentioned in scripture. Every time he is mentioned, he is referred to as Simon's brother. Some of you know what that's like. Oh, you're, you're the brother of Craig. Oh, oh you're, you're Betty's sister. Andrew knew all about this dynamic. We could name a dozen things about Peter, but Andrew, maybe one or two, would come to mind. But who won Peter to Jesus? It was Andrew. So maybe you and I are not Peter. Maybe we are an Andrew, and God can multiply what we, behind-the-scene Andrew types, are willing to do. Just look at what God did with five loaves and two fishes. That was Andrew's idea. So reason number four, again, we are leaders because, because we have influence. Therefore, don't look back. Reason number five, if we turn back, 
We are not turning away from a church or a system primarily. We are turning away from a person, Jesus Christ. If I walked away from my wife, God forbid, I would not be leaving the institution of marriage primarily. I'm leaving the person who loves me most in this whole world. If you turn back, you are turning your back on the one who loves you most in the whole universe. The one who gave up everything to save you, even his own eternal life. That was reason number five. Reason number six. Turning back is absolute foolishness because we have been guaranteed to finish the race. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, this is a, a memory verse of mine. I love this verse. I think you probably have it in, in your memory too, and it's verse 6. Being confident, you can say it, of this very thing, that he which hath begun a what? Good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If we turn back now, we are not turning back from the potential of salvation. We are turning back from salvation, period. I heard a song on the radio recently by the Southern Gospel family group called The Hoppers. They were singing, I've come too far to look back. My feet have walked through the valley. I've climbed the mountains. I've crossed rivers, desert places I've known, but I'm nearing the home shore. Heaven's angels are singing. I've come too far to look back. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, the wise man tells us that the righteous man falls seven times, but the wicked just once. Who falls more? The righteous. Why is this so? Why is the wicked man described as falling only once, but the righteous man seven times? The wicked person falls into sin and he stays there because that's where he wants to be. The righteous man will fall multiple times and the only explanation of this is simple logic because he keeps getting back up. You can't fall unless you're already standing up. Yes, you and I will fall. We'll make bad choices and stumble into sin from time to time. But if we repent and keep getting back up by claiming the Son of God as our Savior, Jesus promises to finish the work that he has begun in us and to save us at last. You know the amazing promise in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13? If you don't, look it up. 1 John chapter 5, 11 through 13, and memorize it because it'll... It'll put a smile on your face every single day. It reads like this. John writes, and this is the record. And I, in other words, this is for real, guys. Write this down. Get it down. Don't forget this one. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that has the son has life. He that has not the son has not life. These things I have written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And finally, reason number seven. By turning back, you would be robbing others of the uniqueness of your personality, the one-of-a-kind you, throughout all eternity. Think of it. If you turn back, never to return, you'll be gone. Forever. There is only one you. Your mother will never hold you again. You'll never laugh with your friends again. You'll be robbing those of us who love you of your one-of-a-kind personality through the ceaseless ages of eternity. But especially God. You will be robbing him of his unique, amazing, endless potential creation. You. 
You are the only you that has ever been or ever will be. You see, the interesting thing is, in eternity, I can be the best friend of everyone in this room because I can spend the first 10,000 years with Alex and I can spend the next 10,000 years with Sarah and I will, riddle, I will literally have the time to, to, to do that and, and to get to know you like completely. In this, in this world, we, we just don't have that kind of time to, to know people in profound and powerful ways. There, there are people in this, in this room that you hardly know, but under different circumstances, namely time, could be your very best friend in all the world. My wife just mentioned to me last night, can you believe we've, we didn't even know each other like 10 years ago? Here we have time limitations, space limitations, geographical limitations, brain function limitations. I have a terrible time remembering names. Anybody else have that struggle? But in heaven, all of that is gone. In heaven, I'll remember all of your names and I'll remember everything else about you, everything good. If you turn back now and are not saved, we won't have the privilege of knowing you. And worse, there will be a vacancy in the heart of God that only you can fill. So in conclusion, there are a number of great reasons not to look back. We've just touched on a few. But the number one reason is Jesus. Jesus loves you. He, he lived and he died for you. It's not just the lyrics to a song or a sweet story. It, it, it's true. Jesus loves you. And he wants you to be saved, to spend eternity with him in heaven. The question remains, do you? Number 
Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus to come to this world and die for each one of us that we can have eternal life. Lord, help us to hold on to our faith. Help us to hold on to that truth. May nothing in this world keep us from you. Lord, be with us this week as we go out into the world. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. And Lord, as we go into our potluck service, potluck meal, just pray that you would be with us there. And uh, bless our nourishment that you provided for us. And thank you, God, for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.